Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity's Merci- sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. Let me just say (laughs) We'll talk about that later. Amy Gallo is a thought leader on workplace relationships and conflict resolution. We sat down to discuss her forthcoming book, Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone, Even Difficult People. Amy describes situations where conflict tends to arise and advises us to not shy away from disagreements. Friction has benefits. Challenging and building off of each other's ideas and assumptions results in better work outcomes and stronger relationships. When it comes to conflict, Amy lays out how we can handle it better. In general, try to think about the other person in an empathetic light and resist the urge to villainize them. Amy breaks down her advice further into eight archetypes of difficult people. We've dived into two of those archetypes, co-workers who are passive aggressive and those who know it all. For example, Amy notes that overconfident know-it-alls tend to respect confidence in others. So it's important to match their energy. And remember, their behavior is often a reflection of their own insecurities, not a judgment of you. Yes, Amy advises us to be the adult in the room, since that is the one thing we can control. Well, good afternoon, Amy, and welcome. Thanks for having me, Gary. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. This show, as you know, Amy, is about leadership and leaders and the decisions they make and how they uh, set their priorities. Your work is uh, also on leadership, focus on workplace, conflict, relationships, and uh, we'll get into all of that here in a moment. But as a backdrop, why don't we get to know you a bit better? Uh, So what was your life like growing up, Amy? Well, I grew up in um, outside Hartford, Connecticut, um, raised by a single mom and uh, had an older brother. And, you know, it was a, it was a interesting upbringing, partly because my dad was a teacher and my mom was a lobbyist. So neither she owned her own business. So neither were actually in, um, you know, what we consider traditional offices. So I really didn't think much about leadership or management or even office dynamics growing up. It was just not something I observed or was part of our lives. You are a workplace expert. So when did you pick up that interest, Amy? Yeah, so I started, you know, right after college, went into my first, um, you know, full-time job working for a nonprofit that did HIV prevention work in uh, Russia and in the U.S. And it was a joint Russian-American organization. And as a sociology major in college, I was really interested about and how organizations work. And I saw right from the beginning, really the influence of a manager or a leader and their skill set on how well those those teams and, and organizations functioned. And as a management consultant, which was my the next step in my career, sort of a left turn um, in my <laughs> career, but that that um, what I really saw was when we were working with clients, you know, the clients were, and my colleagues were very interested in strategy and business models. And I was really intrigued by the dynamics in the room when people were discussing those things. So I got very uh, curious about how these conversations were happening, how communication affected strategy and, and business models and outcomes, and, and in particular, what happened when people didn't get along and, and how that influenced the outcomes they were hoping to achieve. So you're now a contributing editor to Harvard Business Review, among other things that you do, some of which we'll cover here in a moment. But... What responsibilities do you have as a contributing editor? 
Oh, I do a whole bunch of things <laughs> that would be hard to summarize, but mostly I am um, acquiring and editing articles. I also do a lot of writing of articles. I participate in the um, at Harvard Business Review's Women at Work podcast as a co-host. I get involved in video projects and audio projects. It's it's a really fun portfolio of things I get to do in that role. So among your authorships, you uh, wrote Dealing with Conflict, the HBR Guide, which is a classic, I would say. Uh, what got you interested in the actual conflict side of things? You know, as I was saying about my management consultant days, I was always very intrigued when um, people would have, you know, differences of opinion, tensions in a room, um, you know, when People would conflict over where the organization should be going or how they should be carrying out priorities they had agreed upon. And when I started working with Harvard Business Review, I was really drawn to articles about those interpersonal dynamics and how people navigate them. And so the HBR Guide series is, you know, we have the HBR Guide to Negotiating, to Managing Up and Across, and uh, there was some discussion about wanting to to do one on conflict. And I quickly raised my hand because I said, this is something I've been looking at, researching. I'd love to dig further into the research and the advice that a lot of our HBR authors give. And so the guide really is, I did over 40 interviews with experts from a variety of fields, management science, emotional intelligence, neuroscience, and took all of that and condensed it into what I consider a very straightforward, practical approach to dealing with conflict with coworkers. Well, I'll give you a compliment uh, among many compliments that we could or will give you, but you definitely have a very practical approach to writing and it's easy to read and it's easy to apply. So congratulations there. What are the most common sources of conflict? You mentioned a couple, but what did you find the most common sources of conflict are? Well, there's a couple of things when you think about it, so much of what I see, especially now in this virtual world that we're all, many of us are operating in, a lot of it is about miscommunication and misunderstanding. So we're just not um, connecting in the same way that we were previously. And then I, I will say, you know, being this little square on a screen, you know, makes me feel less human. And I know that's true for others. So it, it's, it, a lot of it is just about not giving one another the benefit of the doubt, not seeing each other as humans, not giving one another empathy. But when you think about the research on conflict and negotiations, there's we really think about four types of conflict. And I'll just quickly mention what those are. You know, there's task conflict. So that's a disagreement over what you're trying to achieve, what's the objective, what's the goal. Then there's a uh, process conflict, which is you may agree on the goal. And our goal is to increase us customer satisfaction, but we disagree about how we're going to get there. Right? Are we going to pilot a program in one market and then roll it out in a refined version of it in all of our markets? Or are we just going to go out to all of our markets right away? Right. So that's process. There's also status, which is the disagreement over who gets to make the call, who's in charge, very common one. And then lastly, there's relationship conflicts. And that's really a, a personality clash when people say, you know, we just don't get along or uh, we've never seen eye to eye. A lot of that is about those relationship conflicts. Are there any benefits to disagreement in, in the workplace? Oh my gosh, so many. And I, I have to say, if you're if your viewers and listeners don't take anything away from this other than this one point, I will be I will be fine. Although they they should take a lot away from it. But um, which is that disagreeing is something we don't do very well at work. In fact, many of us avoid disagreements, avoid conflicts, or when we engage, we engage in unhealthy, unproductive ways. And there is just such room for improvement in terms of how we engage around disagreements. We know from research that we have better work outcomes when we're willing to disagree with each other, higher job satisfaction, stronger relationships, and we create more inclusive environments. Because if people feel like they can express their true views, they're, they're allowed to openly dissent and debate ideas, they're much more likely to bring in their full selves and their identities and the experiences, different experiences that they bring to the workplace. I've found, at least in my world, that you just can't take disagreements personally. And if you don't, it 
really facilitates the kind of approach you're talking about. Is that relatively common? Well, there's two things I'll say about that. One, I, I agree there's this you know common advice to separate the person from the problem. And I really do strongly believe that. That said, sometimes the person is the problem. And I do think, you know, I do think it's, it's beneficial to not take it personally, especially when it's a task conflict or a process conflict. And it's really about an underlying business issue. But sometimes it's about the way you've interacted and you feel disrespected or you've disrespected someone else, in which case it is personal. And, and then you have to have a, a rational, thoughtful conversation about how do we want to treat one another going forward. You know, and the second thing I'll say about that is we are all ego-driven beings. That's just the nature of, of being a human. And so it's it's one thing to say don't take it personally, but it's another to really have to calm your ego in those moments and not feel like the conflict is a judgment on your expertise or your, you know, worth at, at work, how much value you bring, or even just what a good person you are. And it, if as much as you can separate your ego, calm that down, take it out of the equation, the better you, the conversation is likely to go. But I have to be realistic that that's just not always possible for people. That's definitely, that can be hard. What about creative friction? Hmm. Yeah, that's a term... I, I first heard it. I'm, I'm not sure she coined it, but that Linda Hill, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, uses to describe the innovation that comes from conflict. And she has yeah, studied some of the most innovative companies in the world, Pixar, for example, um, and really notes how much they um, encourage conflict. They encourage you know, challenging one another's ideas, pushing back, building off each other's ideas. And, and really the, the, the imperative in those environments is to not be attached to your ideas in a way that makes you not open to hearing others. And so that friction that comes from, I think we should do it this way. No, I think we should do it this way is a positive. And they really encourage people to lay out their assumptions, make their arguments, and then really focus on what's going to be best for the product that they're trying to create. It's a really important aspect of healthy conflict is, is that creative friction. You've covered this a bit, but let me ask the question directly. How can we be better at conflict? Yeah. I mean, there's, ooh, there's a lot, <laughs> there are a lot of, a lot of different ways we, we can be better at it. I, I'll share a couple points. I think one is a lot of times, which is understandable when we're under stress and conflict often feels stressful. It feels like a threat, which signals this, um, you know, stress response where cortisol, the hormone cortisol runs through our system. We lose access to our prefrontal cortex. We, you know, go into that fight or flight mode and we become naturally narcissistic. So we sort of lose sight of the other person or we tell ourselves a story about the other person, right? Like Gary is a passive aggressive jerk and always has been, he's doing it again, right? You, you, and you feel that story is so true. So I think one of the most important things you can do is try to think about the other person in an empathetic way. And I don't mean that you have to be kind and generous to someone who's being rude to you. It's really a strategic move for you to get out of that rumination, get out of that self-focus so that you can be in a more collaborative stance when you have the art, the discussion that you need to have. So that's one point I would say. Um, the second is that, you know, what oftentimes we just sort of dive right into the conversation without doing a lot of prep. Um, I don't, you know, I was never sat down in a classroom or in my family or in college or even in a job and been told, here's how you have a disagreement, right? And most of us think we should be instinctively good at it. So we just sort of treat it as a normal interaction, but it does require some care and thought to do it well. And so, my, you know, the second thing I'd say to people is spend some time ahead of time really laying out what do you know about the situation? What facts are true? What questions do you have? What might be an assumption on your part? And the, the question I like to ask myself as often as possible, which really requires putting your ego down is what if I'm wrong? Right. What what would what would the scenario be like if I am incorrect about this? And what would I do differently? Because I think that really opens you up 
to having a productive conversation with the other person. Mm -hmm. Super advice, Amy. Thank you. Well, let's move to women at work. You're the co-host of a very interesting podcast, very practically oriented, like like your writing. Uh, What led to the creation of the podcast? So yeah, the the podcast was created two years before I joined. So I think it was now five years ago, four or five years ago. Um, In the wake of the Me Too movement, HBR was really trying to figure out what can we do around gender equity at work? What can we do to sort of push the needle that hasn't been done before? And in a very HBR way, we, you know, recognize there's so many act- academics and consultants who are, are producing great content around gender equity. And how can we translate that for the average women in the workplace and, and help them women also be, feel like they're being seen in terms of the experiences they're having, but also give them some, as you said, very practical advice, but evidence-based advice. So we really lean on the research there while also trying to give people not just sort of paint the picture of what it's like to be a woman at work, but also give them um, skills and, um, you know, opportunities and advice on, on how to transform their workplaces or their own career. Listening to it, it sounds like you're having fun with it. Are you having fun with it, Amy? Oh, it's my favorite project to work on. <laughs> I, we we definitely have fun. I will say when I look back on my career in uh, you know, 30 years, I think I will, will remember those moments in that studio. It's a tiny little studio up in, in Brighton, Mass. But I will remember those moments in the studio with my co-hosts, uh, with our producer, Amanda, who's just brilliant, um, as some of the most fun and just sort of touching moments where it, it, we do bring ourselves to that, to that podcast in a way where we talk about our own experiences, our current experiences, our past experiences. And we have our listeners are just amazingly generous with their stories. They email us, they call us, they, we, we center episodes around them. Sometimes we remember we had this um, woman, Laura, who reached out to us, who said, I, you know, i I'm pretty senior in my career, but I don't know if I'm really cut out to be a leader because I'm so shy. And that really resonated with my co-host, Emily, who wanted to interview her and then to hear about her hesitation. And then we brought in an academic who really thinks about personality types and leadership. And, and it's, you know, it's those kind of episodes and experiences that just, they're fun to work on. They, make a difference in at least one person's life, but also I think in our, in the rest of our listeners' lives as well, which is, it's so rewarding for me. How do you develop your topical agendas? I mean, how do you develop the agenda, the topics that you deal with? Yeah, it's, it's a very collaborative, collaborative process. So as I said, we have three co-hosts. We also have a supervising editor and then there's Amanda, who's our, our producer. And at the beginning of each season, you know, we've collected ideas. We have a, you know, a Slack channel where we throw in ideas that as they come to us or articles that are catching our eye or research papers, but we'll sit down at the beginning of the season and say, okay, what do we want to touch on this season? What's our theme? And what, what are we hearing from our listeners? You know, oftentimes, like I said, it might be an email from a listener who spark that sparks something. It might be a research paper from an academic who we follow, um, or it might be we, you know, the um, Harvard Business School does this gender symposium every spring. It just happened a few weeks ago, where academics present new research on gender in the workplace, and we'll attend that and look out for new ideas that might be relevant to our listeners. So it's it's an evolving process. You know, there's a whiteboard behind Amanda's desk at, at HBR that has all the episodes and it's we're constantly rejiggering them and rethinking them. Um, but it's I would say at this point in particular, it's very much listener driven in terms of what we're hearing from our listeners about what they're facing at work. Well, that's the best for sure. I'm sure you address this on the show in multiple ways, but how should women think about work life balance, Amy? You know, we actually had a, an amazing interview with Stacey Abrams, and um, she had just written a book with her co-author Laura Hodgson about um, about scaling businesses. They were they were actually entre- co entrepreneurs, co founders of three different organizations, companies. And Stacey had this a quote. I'm hope I think I'm getting it right when she said, 
the concept of work life balance is from the pits of hell. <laughs> um, and she was referring to being an entrepreneur that, that the idea that there's no, really no work life balance because you're, you're, con- you're on all the it's time. All, it's all work but I, and no balance. <clears throat> Right. Yeah. There you go. And I, and I do think that, you know, we talk about it a lot about how do you create a life, a full life that allows you to do what you want to do, whether that's spend time with your family, focus on your work. You know, w- there's so many ways that women are, are carving different paths. And I do think I very much agree with Stacy that the idea that there's going to be a balance is, is sort of just really false at this point. It's, it's a matter of, you know, find living the life you want to lead. And, and there will be many elements to that. There will be friendships and there will be community work and there will be work and there will be family and there'll be side gigs and, and how each woman pieces that together in a way that allows her to also have, you know, well being, you know, strong well being, I think is, is going to be individual. And, and, you know, I, I think this notion that we, can balance it needs to sort of go away. It's, it, it, you know, it's more of a, how do I create the portfolio of things I want to do and how do I do them in a, in a right way that I feel good about and that it leaves me feeling healthy and strong and not burnt out. Well, to build on that, how do you think about setting boundaries at work? You know, I think the, the key is number one, and this is my big struggle is knowing what boundaries you need, right? Knowing um, that working, you know, 12 hour days is not, at least for me, is not healthy, not, not what I want. Um, building those, those guardrails of, okay, I know I don't want to overwork. I know I don't want to burn out. So what, what do I want, right? Is it that I want eight hour days? Is it that I want long weekends? Like how, how is it, what is it you need? And then really, really considering what can I fit within that, that structure and, you know, setting boundaries. One of the things I still struggle with is just that you saying no in, in a workplace often means someone else has to do it. Um, and that I think is really hard for a lot of people is because it feels like your no is, you know, offensive or hurtful, or sometimes you feel like it's even arrogant, right? Like this thing is beneath me. And I think a lot of it is just sort of putting that emotion aside and realizing we all have to have these boundaries. Like we, we could, you know, we could take on everything someone asks us to at work, but we're not going to be good at doing those things if we're not being our best selves in the process. Well, why don't we turn to an exciting new book of yours, uh, Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone, even difficult people. And uh, the book will be published in September. So we are very pleased that you came on early and can talk about it. I've read a early version of it. It's just awesome. Uh, So again, congratulations. Uh, Can you tell us about the book? The idea for the book actually came from, you know, I do a lot of talks and and workshops and keynotes based on the previous book on about conflict. And what would happen is I would share these frameworks, which I felt were very practical people. You know, I always say, I don't, I want people to be able to walk out of a talk or a workshop I've led and be able to put that advice into practice immediately. I don't want them to have to process and think about it. I want them to be able to just do it right away. But what I was finding is there was like always one or two people after a talk, even in the virtual environment who would reach out to me via email or stop me in the hall or the elevator and say, you know, I have this one coworker <laughs> and, and they would, you know, they'd say your advice is great, but it just doesn't work with these, this person. And, you know, and I realized there were a lot of exceptions to the general rules about how to deal with conflict. And, and I was hearing consistently about different types of people, you know, someone who's overly pessimistic, the passive aggressive peer, the know-it-all. And I thought, okay, there's got to be advice about how to deal with these specific types of behavior. And so that's really where the book's origins came from. And, and the book is, you know, divided into eight archetypes of, of difficult, difficult people. And we should talk about that term difficult people a little bit, because 
I have mixed feelings about it, but you know, it's divided into these archetypes. It talks a little bit about the research behind why people behave, you know, um, exhibit these behaviors and then is really focused on the tactics that you can use to work better with this person. But the idea that, you know, they're not likely to become your BFF at work, but if you can improve the relationship a little bit better, and if you can improve what's a tricky relationship, you can likely use what you learn from that experience to improve all your relationships. And, and my hope is, you know, not that the work becomes sort of this kumbaya, we're all holding hands, but that we, you know, that we're not feeling the stress and anxiety that negative, unhealthy relationships with our colleagues cause. Early in the book, you asked the provocative question, why can't we all just get along? Do people ask that kind of question? I mean, it seems obvious that we're not all going to get along. On the other hand, you say, well, why not? Yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, that, that question is a little bit facetious because I know, you know, I'm, I'm someone who believes in, in disagreements and conflict of work. And I, I, you know, the idea that you would just love all your coworkers is so, you know, misguided. So, but why can't we actually work together in a productive way? I think is the, is the real question. And of course we all bring all of our relational baggage to work. So it's not, not that simple. Um, but I do think that there are ways, especially if you're someone who cares a lot about those relationships, there are, you know, research based ways that you can improve those relationships. So, you know, that not that you're all seeing eye to eye, but that you're all collaborating in a way that's, that's productive and, and hopefully efficient. Sounds like you may have some reservation about the term difficult people. Can you share that with us, Amy? Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously the term difficult people is in the title. <laughs> it's um, I had, I made, I've made peace with it. Um, the, my, my hesitation about it is that I think we, there are two things. One is I, I don't think it's fair to label difficult people people is difficult. Um, you know, we've, we've all worked with someone who certainly fits those categories, but we've also all been in the scenario where we've been the person exhibiting the difficult behaviors. I've certainly acted passive aggressively. I've certainly behaved like a know-it-all at work. I'm sure I have called co previous colleagues who were like, yeah, I didn't love working with you. Right. I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, they're, I'm, they can email me and let me know now that the book is coming out. Um, so I, I hesitate to, to label someone in that way. That said, I think it's really a term that we all can relate to. And, and I am talking about archetypes in, in the book. And there are people who, who exhibit those behaviors. So we need to figure out how to work better with them. You know, my second hesitation is I think that's a term that's often used. We say they're, someone's difficult oftentimes when they're just not like us, right? And our behavior, our bias comes into play that, well, you know, they don't, they don't have the same work ethic as I do, or they don't share the same identity factors. They're from a different race or gender. And therefore I think of them as difficult, even though, uh, you know, they're simply being human. And so, you know, I had, like I said, I've made peace with it, um, but it's a term I use, I use carefully, I should say. Yeah, that, that's, that makes good sense. How did you develop the eight archetypes? They're based on the most common archetypes of, of what I heard about from, from people, both who have, you know, the thousands of people who've attended keynotes or, or workshops that I've delivered, but also have reached out to lots of people while I was developing the book proposal to ask, who are you dealing with at work, right? And these were sort of the most common ones um, that that I heard about over and over. And so, you know, it's not a mutually exclusive model. There's certainly other archetypes. And I do have a chapter in the book for, you know, working with someone who defies categorization, right? Yeah, who might right. not <laughs> ne neatly fit into into one of those, yeah. those types. Very um, but I found it a useful... Yeah, 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 but thank you. And I, I found the the archetypes a useful way to structure some of some of the device, you know. And of course, you can have a colleague who's a pessimist and a tormentor, which is another one of the archetypes, and passive aggressive, right? So you'd read all three of those chapters to help you. Again, they're not mutually exclusive. 
is the balance between just personality type and the workplace and demands of the workplace, is that balance different for every one of the archetypes or can you tell that? Here's the other hesitation I have, which is that I don't, I want people to be careful about diagnosing. So like the know-it-all archetype, you know, a lot of people would call those people narcissistic, but that's a psychological term that I, that really actually doesn't apply to as many people as we like to think it does. Um, and so I think we have to be careful about deciding, well, this is just their personality. You know, we behave under circumstances in very different ways. So when you're under stress, you might behave very differently than you would if you're, you know, feeling like you have space to, to think and, and do your work. Um, you know, if you're in an organization where there's very limited resources or the senior leaders value, um, you know, people who, who are overconfident, right? You're going to behave differently in those environments. So I think we have to really think about there is an element of personality type, as you say, certainly influenced likely by how people grew up, how they were raised, their early work experiences, um, you know, and then there's also the factors on a team, the dynamics between the people who are working on the team. And then there's, of course, the organizational culture and overlay that there's you know, national, regional culture and expectations around gender um, and race that we have to, you know, there's so many factors that go into whether and how people exhibit the behaviors that I talk about in the book. So the book is terrific in that for these eight archetypes, you really explain the archetype much like you've just done. Uh, and then you advance rules for how you work with that sort of person. Um, I think we can't go into all eight here. I guess my favorite would be two that you mentioned already, which is the passive aggressive worker and the know-it-all. Could you just give us a top-down review of each of those, Amy? Yeah, the passive aggressive, and this is the one I can guarantee, no matter when, where I'm speaking, what group I'm speaking to, I can guarantee someone is going to ask that question. How do I deal with someone who's passive aggressive? Um, and you know, the, the what's re, one of, what I found in the research for the book was really interesting is that the term actually came from it was the 1920s to describe um, men in the military, soldiers in the military who would agree to um, orders from from a superior, but then not actually follow through. So it was sort of defying the, the orders. It became a psychological diagnosis. It was then removed from the DSM. So really it's a, it's a description of behavior. And I, I don't, if someone has told you that they've never behaved passive aggressively, they're probably lying, right? We've all done it. That said, dealing with it at work, it's one of the most difficult archetypes. It can feel a little bit like shadow boxing, right? Cause you're trying to, to get them to, um, you know, be straightforward and honest with you. And for whatever reasons, and there's lots of reasons, they feel incapable of being direct and straightforward about what they're thinking or what they're feeling. So my advice typically is to, and in the book, is to really try to focus on while they're not being straightforward and they're using these sort of, um, you know, side jabs or side conversations or indirect methods to convey what they're feeling, can you focus on the underlying message? And can you try to articulate that back to them? So what I hear you saying is this, is that correct? And, and ideally you'll get, create a situation in which they feel seen and heard. So they'll feel comfortable sharing that, you know, the other tactic, and again, I won't go into all of them, but the other tactic that I have found to work really well is also to create group norms because oftentimes what happens is, you know, the passive aggressive person will say, oh, yeah, I'll do that. Sure, sure, sure. And then they just go off and don't do it or go off and do it their own way. Um, and if you can create group norms that that sort of short circuit some of that behavior. So we write down at the end what all of our agreements are. We circulate that. We check in at the next meeting. Did we do those right? Instead of saying, well, Gary, you never do what you say you're going to do. You create a team, some sort of positive peer pressure to get them to adhere to that. You know, with all the archetypes, I do think it's also possible if you feel equipped to do to call out the behavior and say, you know, three times we you've agreed to do something, you haven't done it. What's going on? Right. And, and I think opening up that conversation 
with a passive aggressive person, sometimes it's hard because they'll be like, nothing, right? Everything's fine. It's all in your head. Um, <laughs> which, which is an incredibly infuriating um, response, you know, but can you, again, put in some guardrails, put in some processes that ensure they actually do what they say they're going to do, even if they continue to sort of have some of this behavior that's creating noise, can you at least con- get the things done you need to get done? What about the know-it-all type? Yeah, this is my favorite chapter because when I think about the archetype, I um you know, sort of have the most affinity to it. It is the know, the know it all. I've been accused of being a know it all at points in my life. Um, I'm going to, I, you know, I think to deal with these archetypes, you have to admit when you fit into them. Uh, so I do think this is, and this is an interesting one too, because it has a gender aspect to it as well. We, we know from lots of research that men tend to be more um, overconfident about their performance than, than women do. And we've all probably heard the term by now of mansplaining. And, and that's, I do cover that in, in that chapter as well. And I think one of the key things is to, is to really with a know it all, um, you know, to, to, to really focus on facts and, um, data because oftentimes they will proclaim things. And this is the part of the know it all I, I relate to is that they'll just proclaim something to be true. And they say it with the utmost confidence and no room to disagree with them. Um, and, you know, you can say, okay, well, let's step back and, and just talk about how you know that, right? Because my, what I've seen is X, Y, and Z and, and sort of really try to encourage them to rely on facts and data, right? So they might say, well, that idea will never work. Our customers will never go for it. So you can propose, okay, uh, that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that a segment of our customers will love it. Can we run a short experiment to see, right? Really focusing on actual reality rather than in their head, what they think will, will be true. You know, the other thing I think also times as overconfident people tend to really respect confidence in others. So sometimes it's a matter of um, meeting that confidence and saying, I respect your opinion. I have an equally strong opinion and this is what it is. Um, and that, that sometimes can earn the respect of the know it all and, and can help them sort of tone, tone down their behavior as well. And I think this is where we you know, go back to our earlier discussion about not taking it personally. Oftentimes it feels very demeaning. It feels condescending, but. I really try to remind myself that that behavior is a reflection usually of their own insecurity and not their judgment of me. And I think that helps me sort of untangle a little bit of the dynamic and and not have my ego be wounded. How is working virtually played into our eight archetypes? As I mentioned earlier, you know, we really do tend to feel less human in these environments. They tend to be they can be awkward in terms of interrupting or we think we're having sort of high fidelity conversations because we can see people, but you're missing so much context. So they tend to be really bad places to have difficult conversations, even if you're, you know, have video and, and all of these things that we think mimic the, the real interper- in-person interactions. Um, so that means one, we tend to be more hesitant to bring up conflict um, or have disagreements, which is which is a real hindrance to doing good work. We often delay it and we think, oh, especially if you're in a hybrid environment, you think, oh, I'll wait till we're both in the office to solve that. Um, so that that can be a real challenge. And and again, it's just ripe for miscommunication, right? I've, I've heard an incredible story, I put this in this book of uh, of someone who would um, was on a Zoom call with someone and they kept looking up to the right um, and in while on the Zoom call and, and the person who was on the receiving end said they felt like that person was rolling their eyes, but they were actually trying to just quickly check a clock on the oh. that was on the wall because they were going to be late to pick up their kid. <laughs> and it looked to the other person like I roll. And they the, that other person got off the call so angry, so yeah. offended. Yeah. And it was just simply a miscommunication. So, you know, and I think the archetypes – you know, we're all in these environments, we're often under stress, under time crunch, we tend to resort to our worst behavior, which is what those archetypes are, is that our ourselves at our worst. So we really have to watch ourselves to make sure we're not falling into those behaviors in these environments. 
Well, that's actually was the next question. So how can we avoid being a difficult coworker? An earlier version of the book, which was way too long, actually had a section in each archetype of if you are this archetype, you know, here's here's how to 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 recognize the signs and and here's how to to try to counter that behavior. We cut it out partly because it was just simply too long, but also because we realized people who are these archetypes are not picking up a book about them. <laughs> the self-awareness is not there. Right. So I think first and foremost, if you are concerned that you fit one of these archetypes, ask for feedback, whether that's anonymous 360 degree feedback, whether that's from trusted colleagues, um, you know, people who really will be straightforward with you. Um, you, you, you need to get a sense of how you're perceived in, in the organization. And I think, I think that's a, an incredibly uh, important thing for anyone in a workplace, but especially for leaders who tend to, as we know from research, as they move up the ladder, lose sight of themselves and how they're perceived. So, you know, that's, that's one, one piece of it. The other is I, I don't, I, I hesitate to tell people, you know, you just stop being passive aggressive because it, 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 there's often some underlying reason. So it hel it's helpful to understand why am I behaving this way? In what circumstances do I behave in this way? And then what are small experiments I can um, conduct to try to behave differently? So for a week, I'm going to not speak first in my, my Zoom meetings, right? If you're the know-it-all, right, I'm not going to speak first. Or for a week, I'm not going to speak at all. Right. I'm just going to hold my tongue and see what happens. Now, that will probably be an overcorrection, but you'll learn a lot from that that experiment of, OK, what worked, what didn't. And then if you have asked for feedback, go back to those folks and say, do you have more feedback? I've been trying this. Has it has it worked? It takes a good deal of uh, emotional self-awareness um, to an emotional self-control and, um, and self-awareness to do that. But, you know, the rewards are, are great. One of the last bits of advice in the book is to have self-compassion. How do you think about that, Amy? Dealing with difficult people is hard. And um, sometimes it can feel, and, I, and a, a couple people who've read the book say, you know, you really put the onus on the reader, on the person who's dealing with the difficult person to do a lot. And that's true. I do. I do feel I'm, I'm calling on people to be the adult in the room partly because that's the only thing you have control over. Now, you know, could you, uh, you know, report the person to uh, your management? Could would H could HR step in and, and, you know, recommend they change and put them on a performance improvement? Yes, that all could happen. Um, but that's not always going to change things. And so I really do believe that people have to step up and 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 do the hard work. That said, I also think you need to have self-compassion because you aren't always going to behave as your best self. There are going to be moments where you're going to say things that you regret, that you wish you could take back, that you're going to resort, you know, your passive aggressive coworker, you're going to be passive aggressive right back to them. And so those are the moments where I really think you need to have um, self-compassion. And that that's really saying it's understandable that I acted this way. I, um, other people would also act this way in this environment or under these circumstances. You know, what do I need right now to feel okay? And and I think that that can help sort of build your resolve if you need to go back and have another difficult conversation with that that coworker, or if you need to disengage. And that is a, a real key piece of the book is the the second to last chapter, which is how do you protect yourself in your career when all of it, what I've suggested doesn't work, which is a possibility. I'm not going to guarantee that the tactics are going to transform every relationship. And so you do need to think about ways to protect yourself and, and your career. Amy, this has been a terrific interview. And uh, my prediction is Getting Along is going to be a very popular book. Uh, we do appreciate your being here today. I've got two more questions, if I could, more of a general sort. One of them is, what advice do you have for young women in the workplace, particularly if they're up and coming leaders? One, listen to the Women at Work podcast. <laughs> I, I hope that doesn't come off as self-promotional. I really, partly I think what I love about the podcast, and, and you don't have to listen to the podcast to get this, but it it validates the experiences that, that women have. And I think 
one of the most popular articles we've published at HBR in the past few years is an article called Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. And I think there's really a, a, a phenomenon where we blame women for not succeeding in biased situations and situations where they're really set up to fail. And so finding people who you can talk to, a podcast you can listen to, a book you can read, articles you can share with friends and discuss that really help you make sense of your own experiences, how bias is playing a factor. Um, and and just so you don't feel so alone in it, I, I did spend, you know, I would say the first 10 years of my career thinking gender wasn't a factor in how I was being treated, how I was being evaluated, the opportunities I was given. And I think if I had had that understanding earlier on, not in a way to sort of excuse things, but as a, as a way just to understand it and make sense of it, it would have been really helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with that, given my observations. The final question then is <clears throat> along the same lines, but what advice would you have for young up and coming leaders independent of uh, gender or any other demographic? You know, one of the favorite pieces of advice I, I got from a from a former boss who's, who was also a mentor, you know, was I kept saying, I have so many different interests. I'm not sure where to focus. And and rather than saying, OK, you know, what are you most passionate about or or what what do you think you're best at? You know, he said, well, why can't you do them all? And and it really helped me open my mind to having a portfolio career. So rather than having one industry, one role, one function that I focused on, it allowed me to think, OK, why can't I do multiple things? And that that, of course, comes with a little bit of stress because I am. That means I'm a, a freelancer who manages my own business because I have all these other things um, that I like to do and want to do. But it just I, I think we too often push people into specific narrow paths when really we should be allowing them to pursue multiple at, at the same time. Again, setting boundaries so you're not overworking, but allowing people to have these portfolio careers, I think is, is really important. Amy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, very well done interview today. Thank you, Gary. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. I feel like we could go on for much longer. <laughs> <laughs>